You're welcome. Thank you. We were going to ask you to river dance on, but we thought, just in your own time, at your own pace. What a great way to start yeah. the show. It's, it's exciting, amazing. isn't it? Yeah. It still has a resonance, doesn't it? It just makes me so patriotic. I remember yeah. um, being in New York at the time, you just feel, oh, I love being yeah. Irish. It still has that effect, I think. Uh, walk in my shoes? Well, basically, Walk in My Shoes is St. Patrick's Mental Hospital's fundraising yeah. um, campaign. And it's an amazing campaign because we really are at crisis level in Ireland at the moment, and we talk about it all the time, and we say, you know, the suicide rates are really high, but we really are at crisis level. Okay. And um, basically this campaign um, is to fund a helpline, which is open tonight till midnight. Um, and they have it manned, extra manned tonight um, for anyone who needs it. But it's also for information. Like okay. the most important part of this is support and information. Um, we all know the waiting lists are horrendously long in Ireland, um, which makes people reluctant to look for information. But we're really urging people through this campaign to go and ask for help. Get your GP to refer you. You will be assessed free of charge. So basically, they turn nobody away. OK, and how did you get roped into this particular um, campaign? I got roped into it not long after um, I was on with you the last time. Right. Um, talking about my postnatal depression that yeah. I um, suffered after James. So somebody saw that, obviously. And, they did, and indeed. Said. And uh, they basically asked me would I like to get involved. And one of the main reasons I got involved was I started suffering from mental health issues in my late teens. Yes. And I didn't know what it was. And basically, I thought, you know something, if I knew what it was then, I probably wouldn't have suffered so bad later on. So early intervention is key in recognising signs and symptoms and getting the necessary help. OK, so Adam, why did you get involved in such a campaign? Well, um, my mother was involved in St Pat's about 15 years ago and she passed away recently. And somebody from St Pat's said, you know, would you be interested in, in getting involved? And when I heard the statistics yeah. that it mainly affects young men uh, and in Ireland, you know, it's the young men between 14 and 24, mm. very high suicide rates. That's the rock audience. That's the people we connect with. I'm kind of lucky. I'm in a job where I'm, I meet a lot of young people, and it just seemed to make sense to get involved. Sure. And what sort of things are you doing vis-a-vis -vis St. Pat's? Well, um, the people at St. Pat's are amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I give them a small amount of my time, yes. and they arrange all this stuff um, for... for us to do, and I think the message gets out there. Okay, so you, you would uh, you would go to St. Pat's, you'd, you'd address service users and that kind of thing, and talk about your own experience in life? As, as, as often as I as can. As often as yeah. you can. Okay. The thread, I suppose, that, that binds the three of you together is your experiences uh, with depression. And Ned, I'll bring you in here, if I yeah. may, because you, you had an experience of depression growing up, and, and can you remember Yeah, I mean, sure. Started, um, my father was diagnosed as a bipolar at the age of 34. Yeah. So I came into the world soon after. Yes. So it's been something in my family for as long as I can remember. And um, to be honest, it was always something I associated with adults, you know? Yeah. People my age and younger don't deal with that stuff. You know, we're too busy living life. So um, when the charity Walk in My Shoes approaches and says, told us the statistic about 75% of mental health begins before the age of 24. Yeah. To be honest, it was really heartbreaking for me and the rest of the lads. It blew our mind to think that there's, you know, kids out there, essentially air age, that are going through these things that I see my father go through. Hmm. So well, I suppose um, in your own circumstances, you had that thing that a lot of people watching tonight have, which is living with somebody yeah. who has an issue. In yeah. your case, it was your dad. Yeah. Uh, and that can't have been particularly easy. Um, no, up. it wasn't, to be honest. Um, it, it is hard at times. Like, my father always, he, he talks about bipolar. It's, you know, yeah. the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Okay. And, um, and for you as the son in the house, what was that like? Um, well, I was one of two sons. Yeah. Probably not the favourite son, to be honest. But uh, there you go. <laughs> but um, it, it was hard at times. But like, like I said, when times were good, they were really good. Um, when they were bad, you know, it wasn't easy. But. Okay, but uh, and again, talking about it is what we're what we're doing tonight to try and Absolutely. make it. This was normalised in many yeah. respects. When we spoke the last about us, and you you, you uh, referred to it a second ago, but it was about postnatal depression. Yeah. And again, remind us what we were talking about then for people who didn't see that. Well, basically, with me, um, I suffered quite bad postnatal depression, but yeah. having recovered from it and looking back on kind of my career, I probably had been suffering from depression for years, but my career enabled me to run from it. Okay. So I was kind of fortunate and unfortunate in a lot of ways that 
if I was unhappy in New York, I went to Miami. If I was unhappy in LA, I just kind of uh, went somewhere else. And basically what you're doing is running from yourself. And with depression, you can't run from yourself because it will always catch up with you. Mm -hmm. And when I had James, it caught up with me. And I went through it. Because you had to stop. Well, I mean, what was I supposed to do? I had someone else to look after. Yeah. I had a child who was relying on me. So basically at that stage, I had to deal with my problems. And I went through a lot of anger and, you know, a lot of selfish emotions, I suppose, to begin with. But at the end of the day, I ultimately just wanted to get better. Yeah. And uh, what was getting better, it was really interesting to me my journey of recovery, because I think suffering from mental health, I will always be in a journey of recovery. Like I always have to keep myself well, you know, because I think- So it's, it's, it's mental maintenance as much as Well, I think else. it is. I think everyone has their own formula of what keeps them healthy. Like yeah. right now I'm jogging and, you know, sometimes I do meditation. I was in counseling for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But I think as our life changes and we grow, what we need changes as well. And I just am always aware if I feel myself slipping or if I feel myself getting sad because staying well is a lot easier than getting sick and pulling yourself back from that place sure. again. Okay. So there's always a little bit of wariness and nerves there. And, you know, if I feel sad for a period of time, I always notice my family saying to each other, how's Alison? Is she doing okay? And I'm like, I'm over here, guys. Yeah, you can yeah. talk to me, you know? Yeah. Um, but on a serious note, like it is really, really important to be aware of your own mental health. Sure. That's the most important thing. So it's one thing people are telling you, but you have to realize it for yourself and get yourself help. So what about you, Adam? You talk, you've talked about the devil inside. What is well, your, what is, who is your devil inside? What does he do? Uh, well, you know, I think I have a history of, of getting into trouble in Ireland. Um, I think the worst morning of my life was uh, when I woke up to newspaper headlines of U2 star drags guard of 45 feet. Um, and it was like, oh, that was me. That was what I yeah. did. And, and, and had, you, had you done that? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, and I had, had unfortunately done okay. that. The papers were true for once? <laughs> they were, yes. They weren't making what, it up. What had been going on in your life that got you to that point? Well, you know, I, I think from, as from a teenager on, I always had a low-level depression. Okay. And I found that that music kind of relieved that, and I think that's why I went into music. And like Alison was saying, when your career starts to take off, there's mm -hmm. always a distraction, there's always um, something else to do, some other place to go. And I found that when I was working, when I was on tour, yeah. I was fine, but it was when I got home after the tour, I didn't know what to do. And, and my drinking increased and increased and increased. And because mm -hmm. I kept being successful, it was covered up and taken care of. And I'm in a, a band with three great guys who, you know, they, they put up with me. Um, and were, you, were you difficult to put up with, Adam? Um, I think so. You know, yeah. I think anyone that is a little bit out of control and is drinking too much yeah. is not really in touch with what's going on around them. So would they have sat you down and said, come on, get your act together? Or were you beyond communication in that regard? No, eventually, eventually uh, it, it was said to me a couple of times. And I was lucky enough to take the hint. And I think I've, I've, I've said this before, mm. you know, I missed a show in Australia. In 93, was it? Yeah. yeah. And that for me was, that was the end of my world because the only thing I really wanted to do was be in a band and, mm. you know, write great songs and perform to yeah. packed houses and, and I knew I was going to lose it if I didn't make a decision. Why did you miss the show in 1993? I, I'd done that thing of, of I'd been controlling my drinking for three or four months and I thought, oh, I'll just have one. And then I don't know what happened. Yeah. Uh, but I missed the show. And a roadie stood in for you? That's correct. Yeah. And was it the next day, the next week, the next month that you were confronted then and told this is bad news, Adam. You know, I was sort of told that it was holding me back, it was stopping me develop mm. as a musician, um, and it, nothing needed to be said at that stage. Okay. I kind of knew. And was yeah. it the other three in the band, or was it one of the band, or was it somebody outside the band that sat you down? Uh, it was definitely the guys in the band. Okay, and that, that made you turn around. So did you have a, you know, I was wonder about the, the rock and roll lifestyle that you've led and the band that you've been in. Do you think that it, it, was, it was unhelpful to your depression, or it was just hit it, is that what you're saying? Do you know, or were you predestined to have depression, if you understand what I mean? Well, I, I mean, in my case, I don't think d depression was such a big issue, other than it, 
it led to the drinking and the drinking okay. kind of increased the depression. Um, but I think success marked it, masked it, because I could get away with it for longer. And I could tell, I could minimize it to myself. Yeah. But I saw my guy, the guys in the band who were the same age as me having much more productive lives than me. They were having, they were settling down, families, exactly. everything going on with yeah. that. And you were watching those three guys. You, this is what you, you, were, you weren't pursuing the same road, so to speak. Uh, so what were you thinking? Um, I was thinking I was having a great time. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so where's, what's wrong? Where did it all go wrong? Then, you know, do you think that the well, George Best thing? you know, I, 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 I had a string of kind of failed relationships. I had a, a string of excuses for why my life wasn't going well. Um, I had a, uh, a string of excuses to, to, to explain why I wasn't as good a musician as I aspired to be. Yeah. And I just got sick of that. I got sick of it. And you decided to confront it, obviously. Yeah. And where do you go when you're in a band like you're in, uh, with the profile like you have, and an illness that you're happy to admit to, to having to deal with? Where, do you, where does someone like you go? Well, actually, I went to Eric Clapton. <laughs> Um, well, we can't all do that. <laughs> but um, but he's, um, he had his own wars to yeah, fight, obviously. Yeah. But you went to Eric Clapton. What did he say to you? I, I was very lucky. I, I, somebody gave me his number. OK. And he said, well, there's only one thing you can do, and that's go to rehab. And he told me a place to go to that he recommended was a good place. And I said, well, if he's telling me to go do that, that's what I'm going to do. And that was when I, I started to listen to what other people said to me instead of doing the, exo the exact opposite of what people said to me. Okay, and then you're right on the right road. Ned, you talked, Adam mentioned that, you know, the, the, the age profile of the people who are suffering from depression, that they were, they were the rock and roll fans as well as everyone else, but that's why he's kind of involved. And you're kind of similar boat with the, the uh, ORB, the original Rude Boys. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say, would say we're big, as big as you too, not just yet anyway. <laughs> but you know what? A, bo a, a, a boy can dream. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, you never know. But the point is that your fan base are important to you. Do they, do they contact you about things like this? Would, yeah, would that I mean, be happening? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's pretty sad that, um, I suppose, they turn towards a band that Air Music connects to them, but they, like, to, to me, we're sort of strangers to them, that there's these young fans out there, and to be honest, some of them email us, you know, some pretty, like, graphic stuff and get into detail about the lives that they're uh, going through, and uh, it can and, be pretty what, sad. What sort of things are they going to give us well, an, I mean, an idea? It's, it's all, like, a lot of it, you know, some of them are feeling down and want to end their lives. Yeah. Um, and some, some of them are going into detail about, there was one particular case of a young girl whose father was, you know, she got into a lot of detail about her father, you know, messing around and doing stuff to her. And, um, you know, we signed up to be, you know, rock stars. We didn't sign up to... You know, to these, be role models or, yeah, yeah. or it was totally unexpected to us, but um, yeah. you know, we take them as they come and we, we genuinely reply and we, we like to put in, if they're feeling down, like we put in the walk in my shoes, you know, the link and, you know, talk to these people, they can help and all, but it was a really big eye opener for us to, yeah. to see all this stuff going it's on. Because we were talking before the show, mm. Alison, about, you know, I would be in my bonnet about social network, social yeah. networking becoming the anti-social network because it can be a very cruel place to be. Uh, and it's a very difficult place to be because of the pressure. And you're in a, you're, you're as a model, yeah. uh, a very much image-based place. Yeah. And with, I'd be particularly concerned about kids and being on online and, and what they have to look like and all the pressures that go with it. That's going to be that's got to be dealt with, doesn't it? Well, social media is huge because it's faceless. You know, there's an awful lot of bullying that goes on. There's an awful lot of pressure, and there's no one on the other end. I think when you see someone, you know, face to face, and you're saying something to them you know, you're not as brave. And you do see an awful lot of people who struggle. I think it's a really difficult time yeah. to be a young person in general. I think there's so much pressure on the kids. I think, you know, I, when we were talking in St. Pat's the other day, we were talking some, uh, to some of the young boys and girls that were in there, who's not boys and girls, like 16, they're teenagers. Yeah. But, um, you know, I said, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do when I was leaving school. And the minute then I got into modeling, all anybody ever said to me was, what are you going to do when you finish modeling? I mean, modeling is going to end in two years. I mean, I was 18 at the time. I'm still modeling, you know. So I'm more pressure. Yeah, exactly. And it was just this constant pressure all the time. Yeah, and yeah. I didn't, you know, I panicked and I did so many different courses at night. And, and you do panic. And I mm -hmm. think young kids need to just, you know, we spend so much of our time worrying about what we did in the past. And then we spend so much of our time worrying about the future. And very little time just being and being mm. present mm. and then so much pressure on trying to be happy and happiness is 
It's something that, in my opinion, is fleeting, and I think it's a very misused word because I think what we should be kind of looking for is contentment. Mm. And contentment is just being okay with yourself. It's like, it's okay not to feel okay all the time. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to not be able to speak to your family. I couldn't. Yeah. And it's okay to not be able to speak to your friends. And that's why I always say, pick up a phone. That person is non-judgmental. There's no like face at the end. They're going to listen to yeah. you, and they're probably going to offer some really good Which advice. Which is what you you'd, you'd see the social networking situation too, uh, for for better or for worse. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, like just browsing on Facebook with the band, like there's a lot of followers on there, and um, you can see what kids are posting. And again, it's sad to see that they're turning to a faceless computer screen to express how they feel. Yeah. When there's, you know, I'm sure they have loving family, you know, in the other room or next to them. Yeah. That they could talk to or ring the phone, you know, call up someone. Okay, in, in slightly happier news, by the way, you uh, had good news with the band today on the album. Yes. Tell us, because we're going to hear you singing now in a second, so what happened today? It, it went to number one on iTunes. Oh, well, congratulations. Thank That's you. good. <laughs> well done. That's great. That's, good. That's not bad. Uh, and we have another number one superstar coming up in a second with the Mel May. How's your album going? Um, <laughs> We've been working um, to get it finished this summer, which is what we're planning to do, yeah. and hopefully have something out by, by the end of the year. That's okay. our plan. So it, it, and get, it, have it done in the can by August and then out for September, October, yeah, thereabouts. Sort of thing. How are you feeling about it? Really, really good. Um, it's, I think it's our 13th record. We want, to get, we want to make the songs really count, and they're getting better all the time. Good on you. And you were married recently to Mariana. Congratulations. I, I'm married um, to the lovely Mariana. And she's with us tonight in the audience. She is here very, very well. So how, how, has, has, that, has that settled you? Has that, has that earthed, earthed you at all? Yeah. I mean, I, if I'd known it would be this great and this easy, I'd have done it years ago. <laughs> but I guess I didn't know Mariana then. Yeah. And how are you these days? I'm, I'm pretty settled. Um, she kind of encourages me to get out the house and kind of just be a bit riskier than I used to be, and I'm up for that. Yeah, that sounds good. It's great to see you all coming in and uh, delivering the message. It's, it's uh, the St. Patrick's Support and Information Line. We've put details on screen. We're going to put it up right now. And uh, there is someone, as we were saying, at the end of the phone there, right up until midnight tonight. So it's very important if you're watching tonight to know that, as our friends have been saying, simply picking up the phone, there is somebody there and they care. So get busy on that phone if you need to, and all information on walkinmyshoes.ie. Ned, why yes. don't you go and earn a crust there, I and do. Uh, I let's do. look at you, do what you do Cheers, best. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Ned and his fellow bandmates felt so strongly about this subject, actually, that they gave their song Feel It In Your Soul to the campaign as their, uh, the official song. So they're going to perform it now. Would you welcome, please, O or B, ladies and gentlemen. Praise when happiness was a state of mind and not a phase. 
with me and you is the thing to do And nobody can say shh, just keeping it true Let's see those hands It's alright to not be yourself and live your life. If you're feeling your soul and you can't say no, it's hard to stay, but you gotta break away. If you're feeling your soul and you can't say no, it's hard to see, but you gotta break free. Break free. Just bring a bite. To the days you praise where happiness was a state of mind and not a phase With me and you was the team to do And nobody could say shit, just keeping it true